Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're talking to a Ukrainian priest, Father Sharon. That's right. We're going to talk with Father Jason Sharon about a lot of topics like the Eastern Rite churches. We're going to be talking about being a married Catholic priest. We're looking at the situation in Ukraine and so much more. And there is really some interesting content to come. But Father Jason, it is great having you on the Catholic Talk Show. It's great to be here. Glory to God. unpack a lot of really neat topics yeah. it's uh i think it's our second priest that we've had that has had kids on our show and mm -hmm. ukrainian right yeah but, but the other ukrainian right didn't have kids the other married priest that we had on the show was a it's already getting complicated yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he, was, he was an ordinary and former anglican right priest <laughs> yeah so it's a whole different situation at any rate you're gonna learn something who's the other ukrainian catholic priest you had on we had father andrian so dick russ's son my cousin oh yeah 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 okay uh, but yeah, Ukrainian right priest, Father Jason, welcome to the show. Uh, for people who are just tuning in, they're not really familiar. So Father Rich is a diocesan priest. He's a Latin right priest. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot more to the Catholic Church than just the Latin right. There's 26 different rights within the church. That Big make, shout that out Catholicos, the, right? Or is, it, or is it 23? <laughs> 23. 23. All right. I caught myself. But that's the beauty of Catholicos. That's the beauty of universal. And yeah. we're going to celebrate the universality of the church mm -hmm. today with you, Father Jason, and and your unique perspective. Uh, you know, and we have a we have a large audience that's not just exclusively Latin, right? We have a lot of ecumenical ties to non-denominational yeah. folks that are out there, as well as the different rituals within our Catholic practice. Yeah, so Father, why don't you explain just a little bit how you might differ from a Latin Rite, Latin Rite priest, uh, and for all of us Westerners, you know, listening in, uh, some things that we should know about that. Well, for your foodies out there, I like to use the example of bread, you know, uh, whether you go to Italy, Germany, Poland, Ukraine, you know, uh, they all have the same basic ingredients. You have flour, salt, yeast, water. Um, and it's interesting, though, the exact same ingredients each of those cultures does something different with the same ingredients. Italian bread is not the same as German bread. Um, and same with, you know, in Slavic countries. So it's the same with the faith. When we believe in one Catholic, one Holy Catholic Apostolic Church, uh, that faith is given to us by Christ. The Bishop of Rome is the, you know, visible head of the church. Uh, but that faith is so, it's not stale. It is so alive and it is explosively so. And when you take it and you plant it in a unique culture at a unique time, watch out because it just explodes. And so that's why, you know, uh, people who accuse uh, the church and Catholics of being stale and monotonous, they're wrong. Because when you look at the faith in Ukraine, you look at the faith in Mexico, it's the same Catholic faith, but it has taken on a whole new dynamism and it proves that the faith is alive. Uh, so it's expressed differently. The the theology is different. The piety is is different. The, the 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 encounter with the liturgy is different. But once you scratch the surface at the core of it, it's the same faith. One faith, one baptism, one church. I love the analogy to bread, and mm -hmm. and it, it just begs the Eucharist. You know, yeah. it begs that the Eucharist is the very foundational principle of what unites us in Christ as the source and summit of our faith, as is, is expressed in our practice. And at the very fundamental level, it is Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity uniting us as one. And in our diversity, we celebrate that in the different expressions culturally around the world. And it is a joy to get to know your culture ever more clearly in this podcast. And before we go, you know, for us to you, what are you doing right now? Let's just focus on YouTube for just a second. Click the subscribe button, hit the bell, because this is the type of content that is going to celebrate the very fabric of our unity. Each and every week at the Catholic Talk Show, we've got great content, just like the content we have stored up for you today. And a big shout out to our patrons who help us support financially to make sure that these shows continue to get out to the World Wide Webs. That's right. <clears throat> so, Father, you're in uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, Carnegie, correct? Yeah. Yeah, what parish yeah. you at? Holy Trinity in Carnegie, uh, Pennsylvania, and we call it here Greek Catholic Heaven. 
because uh, it's one of the few places in the country where uh, uh, non-Greek Catholics, non-Byzantine Catholics, non-Ukrainian Catholics, whatever you want to call us, uh, understand who we are. You go to North Carolina, you go to Utah, you go to Seattle, you go to Florida, and you know we're not as much we woven into the history of the area. But in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the Ukrainian Catholics, Byzantine, Ruthenian Catholics, the Eastern Rite Catholics, um, you know, we have a long history here going back to the 1800s, and uh, it's just part of the fabric of Catholic life here. So uh, you go into towns, and it's not unusual to see, you know, a lot of Eastern Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches uh, beside the, the Roman Catholic parishes. So that's that's what's unique about uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania. So, and you would be not in a diocese, but you would be in an eparchy, correct? Yeah, you're a you're an amateur ecclesiologist. You you know your your terminology. Good for you. Yeah. So it's just the Greek term for diocese. So um, that's our dioceses tend to be much larger geographically than the Roman Catholic diocese because um, you know we just don't have as many people. So uh, our diocese of Saint Joseph at in Parma, Ohio, it goes from Cleveland, Parma. Cleveland, all the way down to Miami, and basically everything in between. Um, and there's another diocese in the Philadelphia area, in New York, and in Chicago. Uh, so it, it, it's quite expansive geographically. Yeah, I've been over to the uh, Cathedral of St. Joseph. At That's 20 minutes from my house. So I've been there, and it's a, it's a really a beautiful experience. The Ukrainian liturgy, uh, it's, it's there's a lot of similarities if you've went to a Ruthenian or a Byzantine, right? There's a lot of similarities, you know, whether it's... Yeah, uh, we went to the, one in the seminary in yeah. Miami. You guys have a, a church there in Miami, and we got to go on Sunday to um, participate in the liturgy, and it and it lasted, I, I want to say, two and a half hours. Uh, it was like there was so much singing. It was so beautiful. There's a lot of singing. And and everybody was so happy and joyful. It was It was a really cool experience. What can you what can you tell just on the surface? You, you were talking about scratching the surface, and and when you when you what you uncover is the sacramental <laughs> life of the church, the apostolic nature of our church. What what are these surface materials that we're talking about scratching? What are some of the nuances to your liturgy that that you you would like to express to some of our our listeners? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think the one nuance is really encapsulated in the style of our churches. If you look at classic Western uh, Gothic cathedrals, you know, kind of the embodiment of of uh, Western Catholic culture at its apex, you know, and you compare that to the embodiment of the Eastern Christian churches at their cultural apex, uh, that really is a great snapshot to uh, with which to, we can look at uh, how the faith is lived in these two lungs of the church as. John Paul II called them in Orientale Lumen. You know, so uh, the, the Gothic cathedral in Western Christendom, you know, it, it expresses architecturally. It's a sermon in stone, which expresses the spirit of Western Catholicism. That it, it, The liturgy is meant to lift man's hearts and minds up. And you have these spires that just, they scrape the skies. You know, it's there to try to lift man up to God. And you go a little further east into Constantinople, I had the benefit of going to Hagia Sophia recently, and it's the exact opposite motion. You know, you get under that massive dome that Justinian built in the 7th century, and it is the embodiment of the faith of the Eastern Fathers and the Eastern Church and their liturgy, in that it's not lifting men up to God, but it's bringing the heavenly worship, and it's enveloping and descending down upon us. And that's what the, the 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 movement of the dome accentuates the reality of the liturgy that this is the heavenly worship of the mystical supper of the Lamb descending among men, and that's really embodied in the in the report of Prince Vladimir's uh, entourage when they came back from Constantinople, and they they said, you know, we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth, but one thing we do know is that there God dwells among men. So that's just kind of a snapshot of the uh, kind of the, the movement of worship and uh, the expression of the faith as it's lived out in the East. It's not so much lifting men up to God, but it's bringing uh, the heavenly Jerusalem down among men. It's a, a tabernacling of the incarnation, so to speak, at every divine liturgy. 
I love that you said incarnation too, Father Jason, um, because it, it it draws to my mind as you've described architecturally so well uh, Hagia Sophia and and this theological perspective that is so important to consider the incarnation. Uh, you know, the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth architecturally, I think, accomplishes that same feat, as well as Our Lady of Guadalupe, too. Like a lot of the the, the modern approach of that new shrine, um, you know, as an expression has been criticized widely. But at the same time, I think the same aim is trying to express that that God is meeting our humanity and how beautiful to reflect already just on how that expression is being interpreted and applied orthodoxly, mm-hmm. you know, in, in respect to the Ukrainian well, even, uh, perspective. Even the sign of the cross, you're catching the blessing. So again, even like coming, the, that, that God coming to man, mm-hmm. right, instead of lifting, you even receive that blessing, it's coming down through the, the, the priest. And I, I don't know if you guys do that or not, but I, I do know that there are a few Eastern rites where they receive the blessing yeah, make the sign mm-hmm. of the cross. We yeah. would call it backwards. They would call it ours backwards. <laughs> That's a really interesting point because people often ask that, you know, why is it that the Orthodox and the Eastern Catholics make the sign of the cross, you know, right to left? And uh, you just hit the nail on the head is that the people are receiving, you know, the church is feminine, bride, it receives. And that's why the priest is a male. He initiates, he gives the seed of life, you know, this, uh, the logos spermaticos, he gives the seed of life. So when he gives that blessing, you know, uh, the faithful, the bride, they receive that blessing as it's given, you know. And so the priest, when I'm blessing, I go like this and then I go to the left mm-hmm. and then I finish on the right. And so the people, you know, as the mirror opposite, they are going like this here and they follow my hand because the, the the blessing comes over this way. And uh, that's why we, we we go over there. Now, the Latin school is is flip side. Um, you know, if the priest goes left first, then we, we should go left as well. Um, but not to dig on my Latin brethren, Father Rich, but, you know, yeah, we have a letter, I think it's from Pope Eugene in the 1400s, who writes to those nasty German Catholics uh-huh. and says, we receive reports here in Rome that you Catholics up in uh, Germany are beginning to change the, the ancient practice and you're beginning to bless yourself left to right. And he's like, stop it, desist right away. <laughs> but Germans are Germans and they... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, I, that's I've right. Heard, I've that's heard it read that all bad theology originates in Germany one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's so true So do you guys use the uh, iconostasis? Like, are, are is your litur- liturgical practice in that manner? You might want to share a little bit about that because... I went to a Marianite right uh, parish, and uh, that there was no pews. We, mm-hmm. we were all just standing out, and they go behind the iconostasis, and there's this big wall, and then they just disappear for a while, and then they come out with Jesus parading him around, and everybody's like, "Yeah!" <laughs> it, it was like it was the coolest experience of that expression of reverence and awe, right? Uh, uh, prioritizing your 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 uh, praise to God. Uh, and just the way that it was done was just uh, mind boggling to me. So I'd love for you to share with, with everybody how you guys, you know, do that. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's kind of an experiment in that, you know, of the broken telephone game. If you go into like a sixth grade class and you play the broken telephone game, by the time the word, you know, Our Lady of Guadalupe, by the, by the time it gets through 28 sets of years, you know, it's no longer Our Lady of Guadalupe, but it's... Uh, our long uh, Guadalajara or something. It's, it's, it's completely changed. And, um, you know, the church uh, throughout history, um, the faith remains intact and pure, but the, um, how to say this, the expression of um, popular piety has altered over time. And the way that popular piety is reflected in the movement of liturgy and in architecture is has changed so for example the early liturgies were there many of them were stationary in that you have station one station two and then you finish at station three with the, when the bishop and the people all come together in the cathedral um and for doing that for example in constantinople uh they would bring their um icons or holy pictures from their parishes and they each parish would have like like banners you might want to say and they would bring them in saint monica's you know saint stephen saint nicholas 
And then when they came into the cathedral, you know, there was like a screen that you would place these icons on. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you put them down, you get into the, the full body contact that is, you know, worship. And um, uh, in, in the West, the remnant of that, you can see that St. Mark's in Venice, for example, when you have the rood screen, you see that in some of the old English churches, the rood screen upon which uh, is uh, underneath of which is the communion rail. And then over the course of time, you know, the rood screen kind of begins to disappear. And then in some churches now in the, in the Roman church, there is no communion rail. Um, so that's kind of the origin of that movement is that it was per, they were processions and the faithful would bring their icons and they would put them up at the front of the church for veneration. Um, and then in the east, that became more fixed instead of taking them off, and putting them off and on. They just began to leave them there and there became a theology around that, uh, whereas in the east, that frame that they would use initially uh, is what we call the rood screen. But, you know, the use of icons and stationary station liturgy liturgies uh, is, is more of a, of a of, you know, of an Eastern phenomenon. But the, 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 the common root of the original kind of telephone game of liturgy is seen in East and West with the communion rail and the basics of an icon screen. Yeah. So I, I, I've seen this. I've seen like exactly what you're talking about, like the English churches with the rood screen. I mean, as little as four or five hundred years ago, you would still have essentially an iconostasis and no and no pews, right? It was liturgy was, I think, a little a lot more uh, homogenous, even let's say five hundred years ago. Um, but, but even think, even in the even in the Latin right, like sure <clears throat> pews hey, were, before you before you start, just tell Kyle to throw up. A picture, maybe, of one while yeah, while sure. we're talking about yeah, we'll that, that, because mm-hmm. I don't want to get too far into exactly what. I, mean, mm-hmm. I think some people already know about it, but it'd be good for them to put that. Yeah, in we'll there. put that on there. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, so, like the posture, even for Catholics, in greater respect liturgically, <clears throat> uh, in the Latin rite, is is standing. So, like in in every respect, like the Catholic practice was was standing pews were an invention much much pews much are later a lazy protestant invention and, and it, it, well, <laughs> i'm joking lord have mercy they are though. But, <laughs> but but you know to to realize that this was this was a protestant uh you know effort of putting in pews and now how that has become in the form of popular piety uh, you know in in the catholic tradition now now pews are becoming accustomed to church architecture where strictly speaking it's not mm-hmm. you yeah. know and 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 the posture of our attention yeah. is is very very different when we look through the historical lens of what is what is a participation and the form of laity what is the participation as as attending these these uh liturgies mm-hmm. and what do I do as as the leader of my family as a father or or you know what do we do as children in in, in the context of this this liturgy, and that's why I love learning a little bit of the perspective of the icons that were brought in 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 procession. Yeah. Like that's such a beautiful mm-hmm. thing to to think about families doing. It's a it's a beautiful yeah. uh, it's a beautiful glimpse into how the laity and priests work together to build this tradition in the church. Yeah. Because um, it's a pilgrimage, like you're walking from your neighborhood yeah. to the place of worship, you know, That's and you're, so cool. you're carrying your food, you're carrying your icon, you're yeah. carrying, you know, like the kids and, and, yeah. and you're making your way. It's, I think a lot of that would also, Father, correct me if I'm wrong, would have to do with kind of the Roman uh, military tradition of banners and uh, of, you know, having things ahead of you. And, and I mean, a lot of times Constantinople is described as like a Kaiseropapism, right, where there's like a, there's a real unity between the state and the church, and these banners I think kind of reflect that 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 Eastern Roman tradition as well. I mean, when you get into the history of this stuff, it's so fascinating. It's it such is. a deep well. That's well. that's what liturgy is, right? It's a reflection of the culture. It's a, also a reflection of proper worship and mm-hmm. and theology, the works rubrics. the works associated with how we respond yeah. to God's uh you know salvation just the, what is being offered to us mm-hmm. in the incarnation and the labor that mm-hmm. we are called to participate in and, Christ. And you said that Ryan it shows all the different cultures, right? Yeah. So that's how we get these different these different churches where we have a Ukrainian rite, where we have a you know Chaldean rites, where we have Syriac rites, where we have 
Most Arabic rites, yeah. they're very tied to a particular cultural expression. So, Father, Jason, would you explain a little bit what the Ukrainian rite is and how that differs from some of the other Eastern churches that people might even be more familiar with, whether it's the, the Byzantine or the Ruthenian? Yeah, that's a great question. Before I do that, I want to preface it by saying this to people, that if you're coming to liturgy to ask, to get an answer to the question, what am I getting out of it? You're already at the wrong place. It's what you bring to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you were talking about, it is work. You know, liturgia is the work of the people. You know, you think of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19, you know, we are co-workers uh, in, in God's vineyard, and this is our job. Our job, like that of the angels, is to minister to him, to offer him praise. Uh, that is what Sunday is about. So it's not about, you know, aesthetical tourism in uh, sacred buildings. It's about uh, doing what we were meant to do, is to offer him praise and adoration and thanks uh, and to serve him. And uh, obviously, because it's alive, you know, the body of Christ is more alive than the four of us. Um, it takes on, as I said at the beginning of the show, unique dynamism. Um, and so in the uh, East and the West, uh, they have a common origin in Jerusalem. And like, you know, shells out of a shotgun. I'm from Western PA. You let like go of a shotgun and the shells go out every which way, the BBs. And it's the same with the explosive uh, reality of Jesus Christ, is that when he says, go forth, man, he's the, he's the sower who sows his seed and it goes out. And uh, so from Jerusalem, it went into the four corners of the earth. Uh, and those areas that we now think are off limits to the church or non-Christian were at one time Christian. You look at uh, Bahrain, you look at Afghanistan, you look at, uh, you know, Sudan, um, you know, Yemen. Those are, we think, oh, untouched lands. They were Christianized, you know, before there was Christianity in Britain. And it was a Syriac uh, Arabic um, version of Christ Semitic Christianity. But I don't want to get too far down that. So it, it explodes and it takes on the, the form, the shape, the language of the people in which it is uh, by who receive it. And um, the, the, the three rivers that kind of, you know, flow out of Jerusalem liturgically, like it's a trinity of, of, of liturgies, is the, the Roman, the Greek, and the Semitic and the Syriac family, from which you get the Maronite church, the Chaldeans, a very ancient, you know, the, the some of them still use the very words of our blessed Lord in when they pray in Aramaic uh, or variations of Syriac. Uh, the rest of the church, however, is uh, Greek and Roman. The Romans are very unique in that they uh, broke up their church according to uh, ritual. So you go to Cincinnati and you have one diocese in Cincinnati, um, and, and regardless if the churches are ethnic, like an Irish parish, an Italian parish, a German parish, it's, you just have one diocese for the ritual. And you have parishes, which vary. In the East, it's the exact opposite. And this is where people get confused. They think, this is so confusing, all these different... No, it's um, they have one ritual in the East, in the Greek tradition, from Constantinople, one of the five ancient church sees of the church, Alexandria, Antioch, Jerusalem, Constantinople, and Rome. And out of Constantinople came the vast majority of churches. And uh, these churches organized their various dioceses, not according to ritual, uh, but according to ethnicity. So, you know, you go to, for example, here in Pittsburgh, you know, we have a Romanian Catholic church. We have a we have Ukrainian Catholic churches. We have uh, uh, in Steubenville, a Melkite Catholic church uh, and uh, the Ruthenians. They all use the same ritual. It's all from Constantinople, uh, but they have different dioceses uh, because the church is ordered according to ethnicity. Uh, so it's kind of a little academic there. Um, but That's very insightful, that though. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've never heard that explanation. That's excellent. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like <clears throat> national yeah. churches. So right. the the Ukrainian, right, then would be, logically, it would seem, the liturgy and the organization that grew up around the Kievian Rus and Ukraine and, mm -hmm. and that area. So um, tell us a little bit specifically about the Ukrainian, right? Oh, okay. Very good. Well, um, it is, you know, festive. The um, the expression of Christianity and in among the, the Ukrainians 
is uh, very, I'd say in its origin, it's very monastic because of the uh, Kiev cave monastery. It is very, um, this sounds, this sounds kind of communist. So don't, don't take this, but it's, it's very much a, there's a, a people's flavor to it in that, um, that the, this is their identity. You know, this is uh, their worship and uh, it, it's not really imposed from the top down by a clericalist overlord, if you will, but it's really taken root in the culture of Ukraine um, so that uh, their liturgy is just part and parcel of the people. You know, it, it's now, mind you, in the past you know, number of decades with the advance of communism in central and eastern Ukraine, uh, there's been a lot of damage there. Uh, but it is uh, part of the culture. So, you know, you go to villages, uh, especially like in western Ukraine, and they have um you know, uh, wells um, that you get water out of. And, you know, they leave cups out there and it's for everybody. You know, they share it because it's a well. Well is a symbol of uh, of, of baptism and, and people cross themselves before they, you know, drink from the well. Um, but the, the um, so it's just part of the culture itself. Um, the liturgy is very, uh, and this isn't specific to the Ukrainians, but uh, it's very, very uh, Christocentric. Uh, the the emphasis upon Christ's divinity just permeates the liturgy. And this is unique with not just Ukrainian uh, Catholic churches. Um, it's shared by the Ruthenians and by, you know, the Greeks and others, is they begin with the divinity of Christ, and then they affirm his humanity. On uh, the West, it's kind of a different starting point. You look at the Sacred Heart devotions, you know, it begins with uh, affirming the, the humanity of Christ, and they also affirm the divinity, but different starting points. One starts at this end of the candle, the other starts at this end of the candle. They end up both, you know, meeting in the middle anyways. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that, Father Jason. The 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 sense of clerical overlording is just such an emphasis I want to kind of touch on a little bit more deeply with you because it's important reflecting on liturgy, the work of the people in response to Christ and being a part of that festive culture. We all have a responsibility. So I love that resting with the people. So yeah. in your perspective, can you illuminate a little bit more on that? Because I'd like to use that for my own pastoral care for uh, being the pastor here at JP2. So by this liturgy of the people, I'll give you an example. There are two different types of markets. You know, there's the Oriental market. If you've ever been to Turkey or something like that, you know what I'm talking about. So you have the Oriental market, and then you have the Western supermarket. You go to an Oriental market, and they try to convince you of what you need. You know, and they will, you need a carpet. You need 18 carpets, you know. And then here in the West, you know, no, this is the supermarket. You just walk in. You're the customer. You know what you need, you know. No pressure. <laughs> Great. And, uh, and and that's the the I I've found in my 25 years with the in, in the East is that uh, the Eastern Catholic Church is that that's the the approach of the liturgy. So you know in the West there has been a development which is top down. But this is we're the masters of the liturgy instead of being the custodians of the liturgy, and this is where we're going to uh, change this and that. And you the you the people had better accept it because. You know, we're the masters of it. Um, and in the East, that is verboten. You know, that this is, we've been doing this for a thousand years. We come to this, we don't even need books. This is, we sing the whole damn thing. You know, it comes out of our souls. We don't need books. We don't need rubricists. We don't need liturgists. It, we are the liturgists because we pray this every day when we were forbidden from doing it by the communists. We did it at two in the morning in the woods, in the forest, at risk of our life. We don't need text. We don't need people telling us how to do it. It We are the church of Christ, and it is living in us. And, of course, it's not anti-clericalist by any means. They love their priests. But it is one and the same as the people themselves. The liturgy just comes It's part of their culture. So that's what I mean when I say it's the a liturgy of the people. It's hardwired into how they live and breathe. Um, you know, an example, I'll give you another example of how true this is, is, you know, during uh, the, the the communists, when they came into Ukraine, this is around 19, uh, early, early 1930s, and uh, they sent in, Moscow sent in their best propagandists to convince the people that there was no Christ, there was no God, and there most certainly was no resurrection. 
And they gather all of them in here. And this very famous propagandist did this for an hour and gave convincing proofs that there was no God, there was no Christ, and there was no resurrection. And then they called up one old guy and tried to make an example out of him and say, what do you have to say? And he turned to the people, this is true, this isn't apocryphal, and says in Ukrainian, Christos was Christ, Christ is risen. And in one accord, they all said, truly, he is risen. You know, you you can you can try all you want to take to take the faith out of them, but it's hardwired in there. That's, That's beautiful. I love the resiliency of that. And, you know, it, it's it's inspire me about Poland, too, and how Poland, you know, really lived that very resiliency as well. And how the communists tried to steal away their culture, their identity. And they, they suffered that for you know, centuries yeah. similar to Ukraine. It's like surrounded by the enemies of, of, of culture, the enemies of Christ, you know, the, the it's just, it's ingrained in our, in our mm -hmm. soul and in our worship. And that's why it's so important to live the faith as families. It's why it's important to live the faith as communities and to establish that response of the people because it's later Gia. As we're talking about Eucharist that unites us, it's also liturgia that unites us. And it can't be resting with just the pastor or a clerical overlord or a bishop overlord. It's got to be a response. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be ingrained deeper than just intellectually at the level of the yeah. soul. I don't want to give you guys or your listeners the impression that this only exists in the East. I mean, it's not, it's not, that's not the case. I, it, people, if you have any listeners from Formosa, Ontario, you know, they have one of the most beautiful, it's called the Cathedral of the North. They have this beautiful, beautiful ch church in them up in this farmland in Ontario. And that uh, has the high altar and you go in there and nothing has changed since 1890, you know? And the reason is, is because in the 60s, when uh, the one of the local pat the local pastor decided he wanted to do a, a, a recovation of the sanctuary, uh, he was greeted in the sanctuary by the farmers with their pitchforks. Wow! And uh, <laughs> so you know this is ours. We love God, and this is an expression of our faith in God. Don't touch our churches. So it exists in the West as well. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I I think in the West there's a lot of time that the tendency towards ultramontism or mm -hmm. hyperpapalism where break that open a little bit for the listeners. Well, ultramontanism means, you know, over the mountains, right? You know, the Pope over the mountains, over the, the Alps down there, right? Or or hyperpapalism where the Pope, like any Pope just comes along and he rules by dictate and there is no collegiality between him and the bishops as the successor of Christ. A lot of times people say, well, the Pope said that we can do this now, so we can do this. Well, in a certain sense, as the Pope, as the visible sign of unity and the successor of Peter, there's there's some primacy to his position. But then also, I mean, the bishops have a collegiality with him as well. I mean, the the priests and the and the live and the people have a role as a body of the church too. And it's too often, I think, the West can be. The Pope said it, so that's what we do now, you know? On, on a, you're saying on a local level that people could approach it that way. I, I don't want to criticize Pope <clears throat> Francis. I, that's mm -hmm. not it. But when Pope Francis gets to the level where he says you can't put an advertisement for a Latin mass in your local parish bulletin, mm -hmm. I think that's a little bit of an Overreach. overstep of what the office of the Pope is meant to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, personally, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't see those tendencies, certainly in Eastern Orthodoxy, or in the Eastern churches in communion with Rome, mm -hmm. uh, Father, what, what would you mention on? on but those if things? I could, if yeah, I could comment this. too, the, you know, just in the perspective of, you know, the USCCB is an expression of <clears throat> that collegial sure. attitude, and and also the collegial responsibility of establishing unity with with the Holy Father, so that the the bishops of the United States can discern what the what the Holy Father is saying, and then apply that accordingly. To to the worship of of uh, mm -hmm. you know the people and I, and granted like you know your your point uh, we we've discussed this in the past too but um, collegiality is very very important and the and the role of the bishop is very very important mm -hmm. uh, to the life of the church um, but it is this kind of uh, the way that you were describing Father Jason these these candles that are lit you know that that then must come together 
and to form that greater flame, that greater mm. manifestation of light in the ut unum sint that we were called to by Christ himself, that we would be one. And and we need uh, the bishops to to labor in their respective role and responsibility, but we also need the laity and local parish priests to labor in that same direction in the same form of ecumenism that, that we're discussing right now. This conversation is a form of that type of, of unity that we're, that we're seeking in celebrating each other's d- diversities and differences and accomplishing the same fabric of the bread that Father yeah. Jason so perfectly shared. And the, and the lungs, too, like you think about like the Jesus prayer, you're, you're breathing in the life of God and then you're, you're, you're exhaling and, you know, the sinful nature. And, but but in the middle of all that, you've got Christ coming into people's lives, changing the world, and and through centuries he's always been present. So like I like the lungs, like I think that's a very beautiful representation of this, and even to the point where people can go from one side to the other side, mm-hmm. even the wrong way. I mean, of course there's going to be that, but Christ has kept his bride the whole time and and purified her, even if. A pope says you can't put an ad in a in a newspaper about mm-hmm. a Latin church. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you did know? you get the question, Father? I think we went all over the place. I don't. Well, know was it the, a question? I, I thought we were <laughs> commenting on something. <laughs> it went everywhere. It did. <laughs> it was like a shotgun right out of Jerusalem. <laughs> I'm reminded of the debate between Cardinal Ratzinger and Cardinal Casper many years ago over the nature of the church. And Cardinal Casper, you know, spoke about, you know, the the reality of the church begins at the local. And then Cardinal Ratzinger at that time uh, spoke about the reality of the church as being metaphysical and universal. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if it was ever resolved. There was a back and forth, I think, in communio. Um, But the the nature of Catholicity is very similar when you uh, look at East and West in that uh, the Eastern churches, uh, you know, Catholic Eastern churches affirm uh, the primacy of of Rome, uh, but they begin by looking at the uh, the local church and the Catholicity of the local church embodied in the person of the successor of the apostle, the bishop, and uh, and then it, it grows from there to an affirmation of the um, you know the, the the role of the bishop of Rome as the visible guarantor of that unity. Um, The Catholic, Roman Catholic uh, starting point tends to be uh, that, you know, Catholicity is embodied in the person of uh, the Bishop of Rome, and then it, by uh, by degrees, it radiates out there down to bishops. Um, But uh, the, the, I hope I'm not, that's not a caricature, if I'm wrong, you know, correct me, but I think that's kind of like a popular um, understanding of, of Catholicism that, you know, it's embodied in this this um, super cleric, and then in 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 so much as you're in communion with him is the degree to which you're Catholic. Uh, I think people who really don't understand their faith would subscribe to that. Um, but we believe, I, yeah, yeah, they treat bishops like branch managers for the public. yeah, and that and that couldn't be further from the truth. I right. love that you shared it that way because that is the popular perspective. But yeah. the reality of of it is is the fullness of the priesthood rests with the bishop, and yeah. the bishop has that authority as a successor to the apostles over and in governance over his people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think a lot of people don't realize this. The, the kind of modern um, embodiment of the papacy over the past, you know, hundred years, um, it's just that it's a modern embodiment of the papacy with all of its strengths and with its weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, but just because it is what we've we have now doesn't mean that it is the the best embodiment of it. So you know, people think like, for example, the universal appointment of bishops that this is something that you know belongs to the bishop of Rome. Well, if you went before the 1917 code in the Latin in the Latin tradition, that didn't exist. You know, is that the the pope didn't appoint all these bishops around the world? Uh, you know, that's that's just in our lifetime. But now, you know, a hundred years removed from that, people think, oh, it's always been this way. Uh, but no, it, it uh, the, the the Catholicity of the Church uh, is as present at the local parish level as it is at the wherever the Eucharist is celebrated in communion with the successor to the apostles, um, and it is uh, it's visibly um, shown uh, in the person of the Pope. 
Yeah, I think you even look at, <clears throat> I'm going to get a little nerdy here, and maybe Father Jason will appreciate this, but if you look at the, the Exarchate of Ravenna in the 7th and the 8th centuries, you couldn't have a pope become the pope unless he got his approval from the Exarchate who got his approval from the emperor in Constantinople. So these things can develop in the history of the church as far as how the lived reality of ecclesial communion actually operates. Mm. Hmm. That's a great. It's a great specific point to make, and I think it's also encouraging to think about as it relates to the church in its in its form and in its expression today, and and how the people of God and all of us have a role in choreographing the path forward as the mystical members of Christ's body, mm-hmm. and and you know we can't we can't look at it like, oh, this is stagnant. This is the way the church has always been. And this is the way the church always is. You know, you, you hit it out of the park, Father Jason, and saying, no, the church is alive. You know, it's, it's dynamic. It's a living, breathing reality. And it's, and it's moving this, this motion in St. Thomas Aquinas's words is, is that ready to, we're returning to God, our heavenly father in the return and the salvific action of Jesus in his atoning sacrifice. We're making this return and it requires all of us to participate in. And, you know, the Pope Francis has gotten a lot of shade for like the synod on synodality from, from certain pockets, but synodality is essentially that, I mean, it's really exploring and listening and, and in those listening forms all the way down to the very local and most rural parishes, it's a deeper listening to the response of the people of God and amplifying and magnifying that. You know, I think all of this conversation though, it can kind of point to one possible path to a reunification of all of the East and all of the West, right? Where it, I mean, what still separates the Orthodox Mm -hmm. from the East? What separates an Orthodox Ukrainian versus a uh, a Ukrainian Catholic, right? Right? What's actually, what is the real separation there? Is it liturgy? Mm -hmm. The liturgy from almost all perspective is, you know, it's the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. You couldn't tell Mm -hmm. the difference from Constantinople to an Orthodox to a Ukrainian, right? You couldn't tell the difference mm-hmm. almost in every respect, except for a few parts of it, right? I think in its simplest form, you got a guy with a big beard and then an Italian dude, and they got mad about something, and they put it on all of us children. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're right. I, that's, that's the way I look at it. Let me jump on this, because you're mm-hmm. absolutely right, is that I've studied this. I've studied this extensively. And when you look at the division between East and West uh, over the past thousand years, in different centuries, the the goal the goalposts are different, and they keep moving the goalposts of what constitutes you know uh, uh, union again. And if I do this, then that'll constitute uh, you know we're, we're union again. And at the end of it, once those criteria are, are met, all of a sudden the goalposts change. And at the end of it, it comes down to. Uh, the guy with the long beard, I don't want to give up my my backyard here. I control this. I control the finances here. I get to appoint this person, and uh, I don't want this guy over there doing it. So ultimately, not to be uh, cynical, but uh, the question of uh, communion comes down to local politics. And I want, as a as a you know a patriarch of Bulgaria or of Moscow, I want control over the churches, the money. And uh, that's it. I hate to be a cynic, but after looking at this, it's it's really what it comes down to. So, for, for example, you look at the discussions with, you know, uh, the Orthodox and the Catholics in 17th century Ukraine, and the leader of the Orthodox position was uh, Peter Mohila, and he 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 explicitly states the Pope is the visible guarantor of unity, papal authority all the way. It was a non-issue for him. It was Latinization, that the people in Ukraine would have to adopt Latin customs, Latin feasts, Latin, uh, uh, all of these things. And he said never. And he's right. You know, like this is the way the, the faith was given to us. And we have our own ritual of the divine liturgy. We have our feast days. We have our ways of doing it. And so the, the Jesuits uh, you know, under, were, were, were trying to undermine that and take away those legitimate customs Uh, of people. um, And so it gave the the union concept of union a very bad name. Uh, But the Orthodox at that point, they had no problem with the papacy. 
It wasn't the papacy. It was a question of ritual purity, of liturgical ritual purity. But then you move to other times, you know, and um, uh, and the same scenario plays out with different topics. So it's not the papacy. You know, at one point it was bread, you know, in the ninth century when you had the Phocian schism before the big schism, you know, what? Well, why did they break off? It was like almost a hundred years that East and West weren't in communion. Why? Beards. Yes. Beards and bread. Because the Eastern <laughs> Greeks had beards. Um, it, so, it sounds like uh, we it sounds like we all are one, but there's just a couple people like, one thing's for sure, we're all human. That's uh, that's for yeah. sure. Well, and and I, I love the title, Father Jason. I'm ready to read your book, Beards and Bread, my brother, because yeah. that sounds like a really good, a really good treatment on this. Yeah, I mean, even like I think the first thing that even bordered on a large east west schism would I, I think I think it's the quarto decimens, right? Where you had the date of Easter and the East. They they yeah. do the date this way, the West mm-hmm. does it this way, yeah. and then finally yeah. this like, look, you do yours, we'll do ours, yeah. we'll 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 be cool. Right? But but you know this is presented as as Father Jason said so so perfectly. Like this is presented at every different <laughs> forum. Like it's it's presented in dioceses around the country right now, where it's like the centralization of power yeah. and like where all this is is taking, but and it's being taken away from the local pastors or like we're not appointing pastors, we're appointing administrators so that the bishop <laughs> can remove them immediately and yeah. like all sorts of stuff like that. And it, and it is just it's a it's a human aspect of this and what you were saying before, like the overreach in, in many respects too, mm-hmm. because there needs to be respectful space and boundaries. And Mother Teresa said it so perfectly, St. Teresa of Calcutta, you know, she said, look at the sea, look at nature, look at the way it grows, you know, it grows in silence and it requires the space to grow. Like it, it requires that breathing ability to grow and emerge like it, we need to give each other those that boundaries and space here's how i know what father is saying is right is kind of right right They're talking about it's about power right that's really what's ultimately probably prevented the church from reunifying and i think it was the council of florence ferrara where right before the fall of constantinople all the bishops of the east are like look we're getting our asses kicked by these uh, yeah, turks yeah. we're getting we're getting we're having a rough time here we're about to lose everything so they go okay Let's go over to Rome and let's see if we can get reunified so we can get a little of this Frankish, right. uh, you know, weaponry going on, mm-hmm. right? And they go over there, and every bishop from the east besides one who went there said, oh, the uh, the filio okay? Sure, no, it's fine. He proceeds for the father and the son. No worries. Oh, the pope? Yeah, no problem. Absolutely. Primate. So they were like, yeah, they all signed it because they didn't, they were going to lose all their land anyway. And then when it fell anyway, they're like, well, we don't got anything to gain, so then that was out the window. So it really is just it's it's unfortunate, but it's about administerial power, mm-hmm. not really what actually separates us liturgically yeah, or, or, but, but, or or theologically. But you have you have the primacy of Peter, obviously, which we all agree sure. about. Um, you also have these cultural phenomenons and and liturgy. You you have the apostolic succession, um, the the. The, the giving side of it should be the primacy of Peter to keep that intact and develop something that allows them to maintain the subsidiarity that mm-hmm. every bishop has mm-hmm. in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the the answer. That's the the, the content of beards and bread right there. <laughs> you know? Maybe it's a, maybe it's a proposal to grown ass men to stop acting <laughs> like children. I don't know. <laughs> um, so. Sorry. Moving on to another topic. He was quiet. Yeah. <laughs> moving, moving on to another topic. We got a guy here. He's got seven kids. We got a guy here who's a priest. You put them together and you get maybe three quarters of one Father Jason, right? Because <laughs> he is a Catholic priest with seven children, mm-hmm. right? You heard that right. He's married, got children. That's something that they do in the in the Ukrainian right now. Father, you're never going to become a bishop, right? Not going to become a bishop. But... Uh, you can't have kids. And Father Rich, you're not going to have kids or become a bishop. <laughs> that's clear and that's evident. Man, I wish I had some kids. <laughs> so, no, that, that, that's interesting, though, too, because I was going to ask about the structure of celibacy in the hierarchy of the, the Ukrainian rite. Um, what is the – so your bishop is celibate, but um, priests – can explore marriage before ordination, or how do, how does that work for you guys? 
Yeah, great question, Father Rich. So uh, bishops uh, are celibate. Um, priests and deacons can be married or celibate. Um, and uh, the those who feel a call to marriage um, have to be married before they are ordained as priests. So there's a misconception that priests can get married, and that's not true. Uh, so if um, you know a, a married man is ordained, uh, he's going to make sure that he treats his wife really, really well, because once she dies, he's going to be celibate. Uh, it's, it's kind of a joke, an inside joke there. But um, the the uh, that's a misconception that people have that priests can get married. No, the ancient practice of the church is that um, after ordination, a man does not marry. Uh, and there's a, a famous case of Father Joseph Allen in the Antiochian Orthodox Church here in the U.S., you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, maybe 30 years ago, who was a married Antiochian Orthodox priest. His wife died and he remarried and stayed in ministry and uh, caused almost a complete schism uh, because the, the bishop that permitted him to do that uh, violated uh, an apostolic practice, really. Um, the other thing that people have to keep in mind is that this is a question of discipline, not doctrine. Uh, and I think in the catechetical collapse of the past 50 years, uh, that nuance has been lost. You know, they put uh, this in the category uh, with what liberal Catholics want, you know, uh, you know, gay marriage, married priests, contraception. And they're they're very distinct because uh, this is not a question of doctrine. This is a question of discipline. Disciplines can come and go. So long as they're serving the saving of souls. Um, and uh, so this this issue is is a disciplinary issue um, and uh, disciplines change. Um, it is uh, not an easy one here in the West. If people think that, uh, you know, their problems will be solved by having married priests, they should think again, because it's also a calling of the, the wife. Uh, she has to live in a fishbowl on very modest salary. It's not as though married priests get two times the salary of a celibate priest. That's not true. You're on a priest salary, which is very modest at best. And uh, the more kids you have, your pay doesn't increase. So it's, uh, I mean, it's like a poverty line existence. Um, and uh, it's an evangelical existence. We don't take the vow of poverty, but we certainly live it, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, so so that's that's kind of the, uh, the gist of it there. Um, you know, the, the wife has to be, uh, she really is a deaconess, and uh, as you know, the Synod on Synodality spoke a lot a, a bit about this, but it was really far removed from its real uh, usage in, in apostolic times, as you see in the Didascalia and in the uh, apostolic constitutions. Uh, but it's lived out in the Eastern churches, even if our, my wife isn't ordained as a deaconess. Uh, you know, they they would help with baptisms. They wouldn't do liturgical functions, but they would help with baptisms and catechesis. Um, so the the way it happens in, in our churches is that, you know, if you're going to be married to a priest, you become a mother. And that's in Ukrainian. They say panimatka, you know, uh, a, a life giver, a, a, you know, a womb to the parish, as, as it were. And they help with catechesis. They help with counseling. They help with, you know, getting the the, making sure all the, the trains arrive on time in the church. Um, so very few women in America would really do that. Um, it's kind of foreign to them. Um, these women from Eastern Europe, however, they grew up, you know, in villages or towns where that was the norm. Like my wife, Helena, she didn't, she never met a celibate priest until she went to university. All the priests she knew, all the Catholic priests she knew were all married with their wives. And so she uh, just kind of saw what the expectations were uh, growing up. And um, that can't be learned. It's just observed and uh, absorbed. And so when, you know, I was ordained, she kind of went in automatically into that mode. But if someone grows up in like Topeka, Kansas, for example, where that just isn't part of the culture, um, it's going to, it's, it's possible. Nothing is impossible with God, but it is a steep learning curve for someone who's raised here in Canada, the United States, to all of a sudden forego, you know, the second car or whatever, or the vacation home and, and all of these things and the privacy that we like in America, because there is no privacy, you know, you're, you're living in a fishbowl. Father Jason, thanks for that insight. And, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm very curious because, you know, we have a process of, of, you know, the, um, 
bishops being appointed, ordained, consecrated for service. You mentioned that you know you need to discern whether you're called to celibacy or marriage as a young man. Like, is there a period of time of discernment while you're being formed to be a priest? And then if you discern marriage, is it like you're you're in the state of marriage in formation? And you're evaluated based on the the qualitative nature of your marriage and the and the maturing process of your marriage before you enter into public ministry. Um, how does that that all work? And then in the context of celibacy, how how do uh, people how are they selected to be bishops? Like from that celibate pool. Okay, let me uh, deal with the former and then the latter. Uh, regarding the formation of priests, uh, 99, 98 percent of the seminarians are single and uh they go through their you know seven years of formation and during that time they are also not only undergoing that spiritual process of conforming yourself to Christ through you know his operations of grace but also discerning uh you know the the particular mode in which it's going to exist and uh whether a married mode or a celibate mode um and uh that's just that's part of the you know seven or eight years of formation um, what does happen, however, if at a certain point one finishes their seminary, they would uh, oftentimes they'd be dating someone, um, but not married. Uh, they would finish formation. They would get married. Um, and it depends on the diocese. Usually bishops want to wait, um, you know, three years or so to make sure that at least three to make sure that it's uh, that the, the relationship has a good basis um, upon which. The, the burden of, of priestly ministry could be rested. Um, uh, so that's usually there's there's a case precedent where bishops wait. Um, uh, there are a few cases where, you know, that hasn't happened, but I mean, usually they wait. Um, uh, the other situation that does happen, and I, I'm kind of both, I did four years in the uh, Roman seminary uh, celibate, and then four years in uh, a Greek Catholic, Ukrainian Greek Catholic seminary married, and you live um, outhouse, you're an outhouse seminarian, uh, and uh, you uh, come in for uh, everything that the, sem- that the rest of the seminary body is doing, but for sleeping, you're, you know, you're, you're at, in the, at home. Uh, so that involves uh, a second level of scrutiny, in which the formation team gets to know your wife and um, see if it's a good fit. And if it's not a good fit, although he may be a great candidate for priesthood, um, you know, the boom will be lowered. You know what? You're a great guy. Your wife's just not up to the task. You know, sorry. Uh, and that's that's for their good and for the good of their future parishioners, too. So I know of cases where that's happened as well. Uh, as for the, the latter category, Father Rich, uh, married uh, about the uh, selection of bishops, um, in uh, uh, everywhere in the diaspora, their bishops, the Eastern Catholic bishops are selected the same as the Roman Catholic bishops are. You know, there's a turn a list of names that goes around. Uh, it's given to the nuncio, and the nuncio forwards it to Rome, all this stuff. Uh, th- that is not the case, however, in the uh, old country. So if uh, it is, for example, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, uh, the terms of the union with Rome, going back to 1596, you know, are that the patriarch of the church and his synod, that they would select their bishops on their territory uh, and they would ordain that candidate and they would simply inform the Pope and the Pope gives a thumbs up. Uh, but outside of the old country's territory, uh, it's it's uh, it's not them informing the Pope, it's the Pope selecting candidates. Can the Pope veto one of those picks? Uh, not on the native territory. Uh, I, I haven't heard of that ever happening. Uh, not that I know everything about the process, but, uh, canonical right is for the patriarch and his synod of bishops to appoint and to consecrate, uh, new bishops on, on their native territory. And the bishop simply, uh, the Pope simply, um, kind of, uh, affirms that decision or acknowledges it. Who is the patriarch of Ukraine? It's a mouthful. Svetoslav Shevchuk. He's a younger guy, too. Yeah, younger guy. Uh, well, not younger. I think he's probably oh, what, 55, 60. Yeah, but he looks, he yeah. looks really young, big brown beard mm-hmm. and everything. A lot of people have a lot of good things to say about him. Yeah, he's he's uh, 50, 
uh, I think he's 50 years old. Uh, no, yeah, he's, he's 50. He's about 50. Um, he, uh, made a name for himself during the Senate and the family back in 2015, where he just said, you know, the outrageous thing, you know, that what marriage is, what we've always believed marriage to be, uh, from the time of, of, uh, Adam and Eve. And, uh, um, these days that's a big stand, but, uh, um, uh, so that's that's kind of how Western uh, audiences might know him from his stand that he took in defense of marriage uh, and the indissolubility of marriage back uh, in 2015. So, so I heard you mention this in passing earlier, and it's leading me to a couple questions. So you had said that you've been involved in the Eastern churches for 25 years, which leads me to believe that either you're 25 years old, which from the from the gray and presumably bread in the beard is not true. No, that's just pastoral care and seven kids. <laughs> okay. I mean, he, he could technically. So, <laughs> he uh, very early. so you've not always been Eastern Catholic. What were you before that? Yeah, I was a pagan. I was, uh, um, kind of grew up in Canada, Peterborough, Ontario, hockey, baseball. Not that I was any, I was really good at either of them, but I enjoyed them greatly. Um, that was my life. I had a conversion in high school, um, through uh, praying the rosary and, uh, uh, discovered that and my best friend's mom, best friend's mother who led me deeper into the faith. Um, uh, I, I was baptized and I was like eight years old, Roman Catholic, but I never practiced it. So she kind of led me to start practicing the faith and, uh, fell in love with our Lord, his mother, the saints, uh, after high school, went right into the seminary, uh, tried out for the blue Jays, didn't make it, went into the seminary and, um, uh, and then uh, lo loved it, just loved it. My spiritual director said I really had more of a disposition to the East, that I should look into the Eastern Catholic churches. Didn't know what he meant because I thought they were all schismatics. If you weren't Roman Catholic, you weren't Catholic. Uh, and uh, ended up on an airplane going to Ukraine in 98 to teach English to seminarians in the former Soviet Union and just had a, a, a mind-blowing experience of the at underground church. Um, so I ended up living there for three years, married my wife, um, had two of our seven children there. Um, uh, the the bishop there said I shouldn't even think about being a bishop, a, a, a priest in Ukraine, because they had so many vocations. Guys would finish eight years of seminary and then drive taxi for five years because there were no openings in the parishes. So he said, get out of here, go back to North America. So that that's where I am now. Um, but the seven seven children, we have uh, six girls, one boy. The last one's a boy. Miracle of miracles, and it is uh, you know the soil in which I grow. You know, uh, the, a priest. I can't speak for celibacy, but you know, uh, I would imagine that that's the uh, the the soil out of which a man's priestly ministry grows and, and bears fruit. Um, and for me, the the soil that nourishes my my daily life and uh, my my priestly life is the graces that God gives me through being a husband and a dad. Um, and it it uh, helps me to be more more human, uh, more humble. I'm reminded of my many limitations by just trying to lead, a, manage a good household uh, and the many failures that come with that attempt. Um, and uh, just being available and learning that love is spelled T-I-M-E. That's what I've learned as a dad. And uh I just try to apply what I learn in in uh, in that sandbox to the sandbox I, I I I'm running uh, in my parishes. You know, we're we're learning as we go. So, did you? How do you go from being a, a Roman Catholic? I mean, you had baptism, so you presumably had a baptismal certificate. So you're under the authority of that bishop, that diocese. Do you have to canonically convert? Is there a process to become specifically incarnated or, or whatever the proper terminology would be into the Ukrainian, right? Yeah. So like, just like humans, there's no such thing as, as a human being. Uh, you're a male human being or a female human being. You're specifically, um, you know, made in the flesh in, in, uh, in one, one way or the other. And it's the same with uh, Catholic, because you're not just Catholic. You express that Catholic uh, nature um, in and through a particular tradition. And so uh, uh, I was Latin. I uh, Canon law permits change of rights for spouses, and it doesn't have to go through a chancery. So if you were to marry a Maronite Catholic or a Chaldean Catholic, you would simply uh, write on a piece of paper, I change to the right of my spouse or vice versa. She, usually 99% of times is the Eastern party going to the, to the Roman uh, tradition. 
Um, and uh, that's that. You have a witness sign it, and it's put into your mer- your baptismal register in your home parish. End of discussion. But if you're not married and you wish to, uh, for example, if you're single and you wanted to change to the, I don't know, the Coptic tradition of the Catholic Church, then you would need to go through uh, the Coptic Catholic bishop or the Ukrainian Catholic bishop or the Maronite Catholic bishop, and he would then contact your Roman Catholic bishop. They'd sign off on it, and it'd be a done deal. Do you get like a player to be named later in that trade, or is it just kind of GM type thing? Um, okay, because yeah, I'm wondering. I was like, your your son would be eligible to become a Ukrainian right priest, right? Mm-hmm. My son or one of one of your sons would not be, unless they converted. Okay, change rights. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. unless they change rights. Yeah, mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not a conversion. It's, it's just a, uh, you, you go and basically ask permission from the bishop if you can worship with them, and mm-hmm. he guides you through all the. Uh, it's not yeah. not even a RCIA. It's more of like a. I don't know, getting familiar with what is going on and more fully. Would you say? And that was like a unique spiritual direction session that you that you had in in order to kind of discern discern yeah. that you know to have the type of a pastor or or or, or priest that that gave you that direction. Yeah, he, he was by ritual, and uh, uh, you say that nowadays by ritual, and they they, they what they think something else, but uh, yeah, he, he was a by ritual priest who had a a healthy love of both east or west. It's not a either or, you know, of east being against the west or the west against the east. That's so eleventh century. Uh, oh, yeah. He had, a, you know, he had a a beautiful full appreciation for both and. Uh, you know, people don't realize this. Like Fulton Sheen was. By ritual, like he was, he would celebrate the divine liturgy. This is in the fifties before the council. You know, he had a, a really beautiful, fully Catholic understanding of the faith. Um, so it, it's uh, it's beautiful to see that. And we have a, there's a Roman Catholic bishop up in New Hampshire who uh, I think has that uh, privilege as well. Uh, so it, it's not unheard of uh, among bishops, but uh, it does exist among priests. Um, uh, yeah. And and that's that's very familiar to me in the state of Florida too, because there are so many priests that have that appreciation, and that I'm sure that is across the world. And it's the it's people like you on our on our feed who are listening in every week and and uh, listening into this content that we are the ones called to grow in that appreciation, to celebrate the universality of the church, and come to greater knowledge of really the good things that are happening in the fabric of our Catholic identity. And Father Jason is a part of something that I think you really want to learn about, and that is the Holy Protection Shrine. And what an incredible effort you have off the ground and running with McCreary Architects out of Washington, D.C., and the sketches and the design of this church that you're going to create in this shrine for people, uh, you know, in 40 acres of wooded grounds. What a beautiful approach to the architecture that is proper to the very liturgy that you've been sharing so beautifully with us. Can you share a little bit about Holy Protection Shrine and how people could get more information on that? Yeah, thank you for bringing it up. You know, background is that back a uh, year and a half ago, I went to Ukraine, rescued uh, with a prisoner of mine, Alan, 22 orphans. And then as we were bringing them out, this is the second, we left the second day of the war. Um, and uh, and then we ended up bringing out m- mothers with their children. The men weren't allowed to leave. And we ended up uh, rescuing over 40 uh, people, uh, most of them orphans, and getting them to safety. They were within the strike zone of the Russians. In fact, Russian jets were going over their head. Um, and that that really um, kind of took me out of the comfort of parochial life and and helped me to just and the the, the, the the tremendous response that came out of that across the country showed me that people are not that I'm a hero, please don't think I am, but that people are so desperate for heroes. People are so desperately looking for an example of goodness, of heroism, of character and virtue that it is, it it bewildered me. Like I had, I had no idea the thirst. Um, And uh, so I, I began thinking like, my, oh my, what can we do here? Because I don't need to be doing these things over in Ukraine. I mean, there's so many needs here as well. Um, And, uh, and then, 
shortly thereafter, a month and a half, two months after that, Roe v. Wade was overturned. And I thought, Lord God, this is a, a beautiful little mini victory. Uh, it's not the end of the battle, though. And what are we doing now for, okay, these, these women who are going to make the choice to give life? Uh, what can I do as a priest, uh, not necessarily jump on an airplane and go over and save orphans, but what can I do to make this choice easier for these unwed mothers? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that hit me. It hit me hard. And, um, you know, I've got seven kids of my own. The thought of, you know, m- them growing up without a mom and a dad, it just rips me apart, you know, but there are kids like that. So I'm thinking, Jason, let's do something. You know, let's do something. People need good news. People need to see that the gospel is alive. They don't need to see about some saint in the 14th century who rescued orphans. They need to see men and women now doing it, you know, and um, uh, mix that in with my spirituality. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, we're liturgical beings. And if it's not rooted in liturgy, it's just activism. It's busyness. So it has to be a faith of the hands that's rooted in the faith of the heart, the liturgy. And uh, that then narrows it down. So now this is a project that unites heaven and earth, the faith of the the heart with the faith of the hands. And we don't have a shrine in this country where people can go to make reparation for their sins against God's design for life and family. When someone has committed a sin against life, against family, you know, where do they go on pilgrimage to, to give thanks to God for healing, to receive forgiveness and to say, God, I'm sorry, there isn't a ground zero. There isn't one. So I thought, good God, is this what you want? And uh, it just so happens that our, our church here has uh, 40 acres of prime real estate overlooking uh, a highway. And uh, so we're, we're exploring now to see if this is uh, something that can be done. And uh, it, it seems as though it, it is. And, uh, you know, we we uh, have to you know, discuss things with the parish about buying that off the land there from them and our foundation, which has been blessed by uh, my, my bishop to uh, to to look into creating a national shrine. Uh, we would build it there, and it would be the most beautiful Marian edifice in this country. It won't be the largest, but it will be um, a shot to the heart, as Bon Jovi would say. You know, it's a shot to the heart for anyone who drives by, and they will see that our God is an awesome God, in the words of Rich Mullins, that they drive by, and this is a church unlike any other. The interior is like St. Vitale in Ravenna, Italy, in that it is from that period in church history when East and West were architecturally aligned. You look into it and you say, wow, this is so Eastern. Wow, this is so Western. No, it's just apostolic. It's just that from that period in our church's life when we were one, the exterior is a glistening gold dome like you would find in Kiev, St. Michael's Monastery in Kiev, Ukraine, unlike anything we have in North America. Gold domed all over the place with a massive 200 foot high uh, bell tower uh, with four Marian mosaics on north, south, east, and west. Um, it is uh, a city on a hill. Um, it is. It speaks the language of love and beauty. We live in a polarized society uh, in which left and right cancel each other out. You can't enter into logical debates with people anymore on issues like abortion, marriage, what have you. Um, so the last thing left is to write in big circles, is to paint with such beauty that it cuts through the clouds and it gets to their heart. And that's what sacred architecture is. It's a sermon in stone. So that's what we're, we're building. You're speaking my language. I'm in the process yeah. of designing a church as well and reviewed McCreary's materials and visited him in D.C. And what he's sketching for you in design right now and what you're articulating in collaboration is truly masterful. When we think of the via pulchritudinis, when we think of the transcendentals of truth, beauty, and goodness, beauty is a manifestation of the transcendent presence of God and the labor of the people in response to the beauty that pours down in the incarnation. And as we think of liturgy, as we think of ourselves as a liturgical people, and we think of rallying the response of the people of God to construct properly in the economy of salvation, churches and edifices that rouse the spirit of mankind to the truth, to being that extension of goodness 
in the world, the reform of society and the hope that we have in Christ has never left us. And we are united as one in this effort, in this work that must be done in the world. As we think of this reality of Christ coming back to judge the living and the dead, the works of our hands must reflect the kingdom of God. And when I look at these images, my brother, on your on your website, holyprotectionshrine.org, they are truly inspiring. And I love that it is a place of atonement and looking for forgiveness in the very ground zero that you described in relationship to the dignity of human life and the offenses that we as a people have condoned over decades in our in our country but even further before that you know the bloodshed of of so many um you know we need a place of atonement so this I'm very excited about this project if people are out there and they're inspired uh you know one to to donate and support and and pray for this effort um, can you share a little bit more how people could support your initiative and uh, and how they could help? Yes, thank you, Father Rich, for the uh, setting me up with that great question. It's right on that website, holyprotectionshrine.org. Uh, there's a donate button on there. Um, they can they can donate. Um, if they don't want to donate money, then you know we're going to need lots of, of of jewelry to bedeck the icons of Mary. So if you have jewelry that you're you know uh, holding on to. Um, you know, just uh, donate that. Say, I want this to be part of the iconostas. I want this these gold rings to be melted down and made into the, you know, the domes that people will see from miles around. Um, if you have, uh, you know, leadership skills, if you have uh, uh, legal skills, if you have uh, stone making, if you're a stonemason, I mean, uh, there are all kinds of ways to give. But um, if you wanted to give financially, I'm not going to say no to that. And uh, there's a donate button on there. Uh, at this point, mo the donations are going towards paying for the architect design fees um, and, um, uh, you know, our initial seed funding capital to get this off the ground. Um, $1,000, $5,000, um, or, I mean, if, if people have, you know, uh, you know, a particular, let's say if someone's addicted to something, let's say pornography or something, make this your penance, like, I, I every time I I, I fall, I'm, I'm going to make a, you know, a, a donation uh, into the shrine of life uh, to make reparation for our sins against life and family uh, Connect it to your 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 betterment. You know, um, so those are all the ways that people can help. But uh, first and foremost is simply uh, pray, praying, praying, praying. Well, I, this was a really awesome episode. I always love being able to explore more deeply the different rights in the church, and especially with someone so you know eloquent and, and well informed as Father Jason. So, Father, it, it was really a pleasure having you on. Uh, we'd love to have you on again, and, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I uh, really enjoy meeting all of you. May God bless you and sustain your ministry, and through your word and witness, may uh, souls be saved to the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And to all of our listeners and followers, make sure you're subscribing on all of our platforms and sharing this content on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we got to get the word out because there's a movement among us, and that is the movement of unity. And that is founded in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who calls us to that ut unum sent, that we would be one and reflect the very glory of the Trinity on earth. God bless you. We'll see you next week.